Good morning, church. Good to see you. And we are moving into the second week of a series called Our Spiritual Matrix. Being equipped for the cosmic battle, we have kind of the, the backdrop of the Matrix, which was sort of my favorite movie. And uh, it's this idea that we exist in a life, in a world where we're interacting with good and bad, with, with God and Satan, with with evil forces as well as spiritual good forces, oftentimes without even realizing it. Often pay, not paying it much heed, or sometimes the other extreme, paying it too much heed. And so the idea is, how do we understand and live rightly in the middle of this kind of spiritual matrix? The answers are given to us, as you might guess, in the Bible. Paul talks about using a metaphor for Christians being spiritually equipped with a spiritual armor. And he uses the armor of a Roman soldier as a metaphor for us to kind of unpack. There's a picture of somebody dressed up. It's probably someone going to a Halloween party. Um, dressed up like a Roman soldier. And you can kind of see the helmet. Then you've got the breastplate. You've got the, the belt. Uh, he's not holding a shield or a sword there, but you can imagine that. There are the shoes with the shin guards. Um, the very first soccer player right there. Um, that was funnier than that, guys. Come on, laugh. So, uh, and so Paul is using something that everyone knows and sees in his day and time as a metaphor to say, God is clothing you as a follower of Christ spiritually with these things. And he associates each article of clothing with a spiritual truth. The first one that he talks about and that we'll talk about today is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Of truth. So, with that image in mind, listen once again with fresh ears to the way Paul talks about this, and we'll talk about the whole text this time in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, beginning with verse 10 through 17. He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Now, we stopped there last week. That was sort of the preface for why we need to put on this armor. Now he describes the armor, beginning in verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers do fade, but the Word of the Lord stands forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. May your Spirit empower us, convict us, compel us, teach us, change us, O God. May your words prevail, not my word or our words. And we pray this all in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, this idea of the belt of truth, that's what we're focusing on. And it's a, a, an age-old question that I've titled the sermon, What is Truth? What is truth? It's the philosophical question. It's a good question. It's not a bad question. No matter where you are in life, where you are in your faith. It is the question for which Jesus died, quite literally. One of the last questions, probably the second to last question he actually heard before he died. Remember the scene? Jesus is arrested. He's in front of Pontius Pilate. Pilate understands that the people are paying homage to him as a king. And he's questioning Jesus back and forth. And here's how the dialogue goes in the 19th, 18th chapter of the Gospel of John. Pilate says, you are a king then. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And then the classic question from Pilate's mouth. What is truth? And with that he went out and told the Jews gathered there he finds no basis against him. What is truth? Isn't, isn't that the age old, that's the million dollar question that leads us and guides us through life. And 
The, the problem with the way that Pilate was coming at Jesus, with God incarnate in front of him, he's sort of flippantly saying, what is truth? And turns around and goes his own way without really taking Jesus seriously. That's really kind of, it, that embodies life and people and us, doesn't it? We don't take the truth that we see embodied in Jesus in front of us seriously enough. Why? Because we think that truth is often so subjective, we can kind of define it ourselves. The truth that guides us and leads us forward is the truth that we want it to be, that we make it to be. I'm reminded of a, 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 one of my favorite movies. It's really kind of a eerie movie, uh, actually, but it's very intriguing because the movie is, it, it depicts the theme from backwards forwards. The end of the movie starts. It's a movie called Memento. Years ago, I think it was in the mid-90s it came out. And, and, and the guy who plays M Memento has Korsakov syndrome. And Korsakov syndrome means that he has no long-term memory. He only has short-term memory. Well, he got this syndrome because of a traumatic injury, supposedly battling a guy who killed his wife. But he didn't remember how his wife had died. And so he had tattooed all over his body in reverse all the facts and the details of his wife's murder, including one across his chest that said, John G. raped and murdered my wife. So that every day he would look in the mirror and see that truth, and that truth would define his vengeance and how and who he would exact his vengeance until it was accomplished. Only problem is the movie suggests after he moves down that path that that original truth that he had tattooed on him that led him and guided his life that he was obsessed over may have been a false truth. And so every action off of that original truth was an error based on that original error. That's what happens when truth is self-defined, self-constructed, when we etch truth in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, in our priorities, in our faith, based on what we think, what we feel, what we want, and not on something outside of us that's objective. We, the, truth is we, the truth is, we often can't trust ourselves, our own motives. Our own, we have to question our own questions. Questioning is good. It's a part of faith. But question your questions. Question your own motives. There's a, I was watching a documentary about Mark Healy. Mark Healy, interesting guy. He's, a, he's, he's known as a big wave surfer, one of these radical guys. But he's also known as one of the world's leading skin divers. He can hold his breath for five minutes underwater. He is known for diving with sharks. There's this classic picture of Mark diving, holding onto a great white shark, holding his breath, being towed by a 15-foot great white shark that could have him as an appetizer. Absolutely amazing. He was interviewed after that. And Healy made this interesting comment. He said, you know, you can judge a shark based on his actions. Sharks are honest. You can tell if they're aggressive or not. He said, not so with people. People have ulterior motives. And then he made this incredible statement. He said, people are a lot more dangerous than sharks. It's the idea of questioning your own motives, questioning the motives of others, questioning our questions, and our seeking out truth of life. And so what I want to share with you is a few things about the idea of truth and, and the problems of truth in American culture. I want to share with you in that regard one statistic and two what I think are big issues, big giant issues that are hurdles for a lot of people. Some of them might be hurdles for you or for someone you know. See how they apply. The first is a statistic. I think the Barna Group actually came up with a statistic, found this out, that only two in ten Americans believe there are absolute moral truths. Now, that might be good news for a lot of people. Obviously, for 8 out of 10 people, that's great news. <laughs> what that says to me, though, is that truth is relative. Truth is subjective. The truth by which we live our lives is self-defined, self-etched. We tattoo it as we want it to be in our lives. And, and truth, therefore, becomes a lot like wearing blue jeans. You know why you put on blue jeans, right? Everyone puts on blue jeans because they're comfortable. You want your, je your jeans either to be loose and comfy, so you can lounge around, or some of you are into the skinny jeans thing, right? And you want it to conform to you and to look fashionable. In either case, they serve your own 
subjective purposes and wants and desires. And that's something that we have to question. Is truth serving us, our desires, what we think, what we feel at any moment, or does it come from outside of us? So I think there are two big hurdles, and these are two issues that I want to suggest to you that we have to look at. One is called the proof issue. Uh, we're products of modernity. Since the Enlightenment, uh, since industrialization, uh, science, the rise of science, and the rational mind, the proof issue has been a, difficulty, a difficult one because modernity resists unscientific truth claims. Um, people often think that who are looking at things for proof that it needs to be replicated through the scientific method. It needs to be duplicated. It needs to be tangible, empirical evidence for it to be true. But we all know that there is a difference between truth that's empirical and truth that's spiritual. We know that we can have certainty, for instance, about some things in multiple different ways, right? It's, there's not one dimension. If you tell me someone is cooking bacon in the kitchen, you could know, you could be certain, you could have knowledge about that bacon cooking through multiple sensory mechanisms, right? You could see it. Uh, or you may not see it, you may smell it. You, oh, there's bacon. I know it's bacon. You might hear it. You can hear the sound of bacon. You might taste it. There are multiple ways, you might touch it. There, there are multiple ways for us to know with certainty truth. And so we can't ever isolate it to one way of knowing. That's the idea of questioning our own need for competence. You know, we have to be sure through our competence that something is true. Rather, what I like to do is base my certainty on the one who knows. That means I don't have to know everything. If, if I know the one who knows, if I trust the one who knows, that means I don't have to be God. I don't have to have all the answers. I trust the one who created at all. I was having a conversation with a colleague and, and years ago and she was critiquing another church and the way that they were teaching certainty to their youth group. And I thought about it for a moment. Really, you're falling into this same trap as the modern culture trap. Where there's only one way of knowing, but we know there are multiple ways of knowing truth. So the proof issue is one that can be a hurdle for you or for someone you know. A lot of scientists, a lot of medical doctors, that's a hurdle for them. Here's the second, the second issue, second problem, second hurdle. It's what I call the authority issue, the authority issue. Postmodernity, you know, modernity is based on empirical evidence and what but postmodernity is based a lot more on feelings, on interpretation, on sensation. It's more subjective. It resists imposed truth claims. In other words, someone from the outside telling you what to do, what to think, what to believe. It resists that. Because there can't be one meta-narrative, one idea that connects it all together. There can't just be one answer, one umbrella under which everything is explained. But isn't it interesting that even in the most sophisticated field of science, in metaphysics, that's exactly the question they're seeking. Stephen Hawking, who was this brilliant mind, after which the movie was made, The Theory of Everything, depicts his one quest, his lifelong quest, is the one theory that connects everything together. Isn't it interesting in the world of physics that scientists have found one elemental particle that they think connects all matter and explains all things in the universe? And what do they call that one particle? The God particle. You see, it's not limiting like we might think it is from a modern or postmodern perspective to say that there is one truth that brings it all together. Often we get what's called truth fever. That's what I call truth fever. Sort of contempt for what seems to be limiting in the way of describing truth. It's like rock fever. I've explained that before. People who live on an island for a while, like Hawaii or Guam or Tahiti, actually feel like they're trapped. And like paradise has become a jail. And their perspective of a beautiful, incredible place like this has become totally twisted. And, and, and that's often the way we treat the beauty of God's truth. Suddenly, we're, you know, sort of trapped in it and not liberated by it, not enjoying its beauty. And so let's talk about truth. 
I want to share a few things about the truth promises of Christianity with you. And the first one is the absolute, hands down, most important promise for all of us. Everything is built on this. And this is what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6. When he, speaking about himself, said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Not a way. The way. The truth. The life. Now, what's important about this is something that we often sort of gloss over. And that is that Jesus was talking about himself, not an idea, not a philosophy, not a set of morals, not ethics, not any teaching, but about him. It was God incarnate. He embodies truth. And so when we live our lives in him and he is in us, we embody truth. It's not about the external doing things that he teaches us to do. It's about him possessing us, living in us. He embodied truth, and so we do as we live in him. And that leads to the second, uh, second thing I want to point out about truth, and that is that Christians inherit the truth. We inherit this. Just like if you have children or grandchildren, they inherit something. It's given without their necessarily deserving it. And nothing can change the fact that they inherit this. God gives us Himself. His very self. Living in us. This is an inheritance that's very specific. It's not conditional. Listen to the way Paul puts it in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 1. Where he is describing some amazing news for us. In the very first few words he says, In Him we were also chosen. In Him God himself chose you. He chose you to be in him. Not to follow a set of rules. Having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, not our will, his will, in order that we, who are the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory, not our glory, his. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. The gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him, again, in Him, with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing, guaranteeing our inheritance, this truth, this God, until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise, again, of His glory, not of ours. This is an inheritance. It's specific. It's not circumstantial. The, the, the things that happen in your life don't change the truth that you inherit, that I inherit. The things that happen in the world, and the world is changing at mock speed. The things that happen in our culture do not change this anchor, this truth for us. And listen, this is so very important because it's always a threat, and it always has been. Remember what was happening in the 1930s. We all know our history lesson. What was going on in Europe in the 1930s? It was, it was Adolf Hitler and Nazism. Do you know that, the, that Hitler took over the churches in Germany at that time? And there, was a group, there were a group of Christians who banded together secretly to protest. And they wrote a document called the Barman Declaration. And the Barman Declaration, they made a declaration. They said, there is only one Lord of the church, Jesus Christ. It was implying, obviously, it's not Hitler. Now, they were then put on Hitler's blacklist. And he wanted to murder them all. And in the middle of that, another group of Christians in Germany got together in June of 1934, and they put together what was called the Amsbacher Consultation. And you won't believe what they said. They actually wrote a document that said that the church should take its cues for what it believes and what it does from its culture. It should adapt itself radically to the new situation in Germany. And then here's what they said. I want, you, I want you to put that picture of Hitler back up there again. They said we should do this recognizing that God has given the German people, and I quote, a pious and faithful ruler in the person of Adolf Hitler. Now what if that had prevailed? What if he defined the truth of Christianity from that point on. You see, that leads to the next point I want to share with you and, and why it's so important, and that is that Christians preserve the truth. We preserve the truth. 
Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 1, how the Holy Spirit comes and brings the truth in us and is sealed by the Holy Spirit in us. Anybody here ever practice canning? Anybody ever do any canning? Uh, my, my grandmother used to have some canned goods like that. And the idea, obviously, is that you take whatever vegetable or fruit and you preserve it in this can that's airtight. And by being airtight, it's preserved pretty much indefinitely, I think, or for a very, very long time. The outside air is what spoils it. And it's that same idea. God says he puts his treasure in clay jars. Guess who the clay jars are? You and me. To preserve the truth in us so that they won't spoil from the outside influences and forces of our culture, of our feelings, of our circumstances, and so on. Now, I know that some of you at this point are going, gosh, Tim, you're sounding kind of, kind of conservative and fundamentalist at this point. But let me, if you're thinking that, share something that I think is very important. Christianity does not contain all truth, though it is all true. Do you get that? Christianity does not contain all truth. There are things that are true outside of the Bible, right? But everything about the Bible is true. And so this becomes our guide for understanding and measuring all other things in life. Example, we can learn from other religions. Martin Luther King Jr., leader of the civil rights, a Baptist minister, went to India to learn about nonviolence resistance, its strategy, its practice, its philosophy. And he came back to America and he implemented what he learned from Gandhi and the teachings of Gandhi and Hinduism into his, his work as a civil rights leader and as a Christian minister. And he began to see more deeply the nonviolent practices of Christ himself in the gospel. Now, he didn't go there to become a Hindu, but he learned something that actually shed light on the deeper truths of Scripture. And he learned some practices that were outside of Scripture. And, and, and we do that all the time, don't we? You cannot go to the Bible to learn how to be a good cook. Well, you can learn how to maybe make a Seder meal or something like that, but you're not going to learn how to do, you're not going to learn how to barbecue ribs by looking at the book of Ephesians. All right? You're not going to go to the Bible to learn how to be a good golfer. Uh, you're not going to go to the Bible to learn the theory of relativity. There are all kinds of truths about living this life that we can recognize are given to us by God that are outside of the Bible. You go to the Bible if you want to know who you are. If you want to know how you live. If you want to know who God is and what God's plans are. That's when you go to this source as the truth and you measure all other truths against that. And you embrace all other truths as gifts of the same God, even though they're not necessarily found in Scripture. And so all this leads to our focus today, which is with this garment that we're putting on, is the idea of putting on the belt of truth. It's the very first thing that Paul talks about. And it's the most important piece because it pulls it all together. The belt of truth keeps the rest of the armor, so to speak, together. It holds it together. There's an interesting translation of this, this verse, putting on the belt of truth, in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And it goes like this. Having girded your loins with truth. Now, we don't often go around using the word loins unless we're like, you know, at the store buying some meat to grill or whatever. Loins is sort of, you know, your, your midsection here. And if you do like Pilates work, you know, they talk about strengthening your core. And it's that idea of your loins. And uh, what, what, what they would do is they would use loincloths because they wore, everyone wore kind of like, you know, gowns back then. They would use a loincloth as a belt to gird up, pull up. And ladies, you're familiar with this, with dresses. You, if you pull them up, then you kind of tie it off so that your legs are free. In other words, the belt of truth, girding up your loins, is meant to free you up, not hinder you, not stop you, not restrict you, but to free your movement. Truth is the belt that connects all of these things together and frees you up. Righteousness, being right and religious, without truth is empty. Faithfulness, you can you know, have faith, but if it's not connected to truth outside of your own feelings, it's misguided. And so, the belt of truth, it frees you up. The belt of truth gives us the ultimate freedom that we need to live rightly with God, with ourselves, with our neighbors, and with all creation. Why? Because we can trust God. We can freely trust that He knows what we don't know. 
and don't need to know. I don't have to be God because He is. I don't have to be in control of my life or in the lives of others. I can trust that my children are okay. I can trust that the future is okay. No matter what I face or we face, there's great freedom in that truth. I can live rightly with myself. Why? Because the Bible tells me the truth that I am created and you are created in the image of God. That means you're the crown of creation. That means your self-image, your self-worth, your sense of where you're going in life is guided by that truth above all other truths or mistruths. Especially how you feel about yourself or how others think of you or your performance with regard to academics or work or whatever. Knowledge of yourself is grounded in knowledge of God. And, and when we live rightly with others, with neighbors, why? Because we learn to love what God loves. That's what Jesus embodied. He came to love sinners. Not like them, not tolerate them, but to love the worst. He, he shows us how to love well as we see life through His eyes. And we live rightly with creation because we recognize from the truth of Scripture that God created it all good as a gift to us, not to conquer, not to use up, to abuse for our own wants and wills, but as a gift of grace. And so we're free. The belt of truth girds up our loins to live life freely with God and one another, with ourselves, with all creation. Freedom, friends, is grounded in the truth that God gives us. It's interesting, this, this idea of loins, there's an ancient church, church father named John Chrysostom who said it this way. He said, loins, like a keel, are the, control, are the central balance support of the body. You know, and that's why when you're doing physical therapy, they're often wanting to work on your, your core. It's sort of the keel, your loins. It kind of keeps everything stable. Anybody know what a keel is? A keel, I have a picture of a sailboat, a few sailboats with some keels. A keel is the thing that hangs down below the sailboat, and it keeps it stable so that it can't rock, it can't be thrown easily over uh, by waves. I remember years ago, back in the early 90s, I was leading, I was a youth director in a church in Tampa, and we took a group of youth to the Bahamas from Miami on a 62-foot boat. And uh, it's another story altogether, but the captain of the boat, he had about six flats of beer, and he was drunk within about an hour after we set sail, which is why he told me the, the heading and put me in charge of, of sailing the boat. Uh, so it was a little interesting. Now, before he got totally wasted drunk, he told me about the boat. It's a 62-foot boat, a big boat. And the keel on that boat was 5,000 pounds. You know what that did? That kept that boat incredibly stable. He said it would take a hurricane to turn this boat over. So we're coming back from uh, the Bimini, crossing the Gulf Stream. And there are 22 youth and uh, adult volunteers, uh, leaders in this boat. And I'm at the helm. And we hit 10 to 12-foot seas. People were getting sick, yelling. It was, it was, it was kind of crazy, but I was laughing. I was having fun with it. I wasn't afraid of it. Why? Because I knew the kind of keel that boat had. We had nothing to be afraid of, nothing to fear. It was always going to keep us stable and sailing steady on. You see, putting on the belt of truth means we fear only God, not the devil. We don't fear evil. We don't fear darkness. We don't fear regret. We don't fear the future. I just had a talk with a guy at the early service. And he has been a survivor of pancreatic cancer for years. Defied all the odds. But guess what? Chemo has, has ended its effectiveness for him. And with tears rolling down his streak, he's looking at the end of his life. And so what I said in that context is as applicable and real to him as it is for us. And that is we don't even fear death. We don't fear the worst. Why? Because we have a keel. We have something we can depend on that will take us through the darkest hours of life and even death. And so that's why the writer of Proverbs says, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now fear, in this sense, is not trembling and being afraid and cowering. It's the idea of awe and respect. Just like I had awe and respect for that keel on that boat. And it freed me up to enjoy, in fact, to not be afraid of the rough seas ahead. Listen, 
Whether you call it Satan or the devil or evil or whatever in the New Testament, there are only two reasons why he is mentioned in the New Testament. There are two things that are taught to us about the devil in the New Testament. And the first one is the most important one. It is that he has been defeated by Christ. He has been defeated. But we live in a time when he's still, he's still roaming. And the second thing that it teaches us is important. And that is that he's a deceiver. He is the deceiver. President of Princeton Seminary, where I went to seminary, had a picture hanging in the back room of his office. It's a picture uh, of, of a dragon that is leaning up against a tree. In the background, there is a medieval castle. You can see a picture here. And he is picking his teeth with the lance of a knight. And you can see the different armor of the knight sort of scattered around on the ground. The implication being that he has eaten the knight, right? And at the bottom of the picture is this quote, no matter how hard you work, no matter how right you are, sometimes the dragon wins. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like, my gosh, the dragon is winning in my emotional life, in my family life, in my relational life, in my spiritual life, in my physical life, whatever it is, the dragon is winning. But the truth that we gird ourselves with, my friends, is no matter what the circumstances are, the dragon has been defeated because it's a lie. It's his deception to live life based on that image. God wins. God wins. And because God wins, you win. I win. We win. And we live our lives in light of that victory. That, my friends, is how we begin to live with the belt of truth gathered around our lives. This table that we come to today as we celebrate the Lord's table embodies a tangible expression of the truth that Jesus died for us. And Jesus was raised to life. His body was given. His blood was spilled so that you and I might have His resurrected life living in us, guiding us forward so that all these truths can be real and not just something of the past. And so He alone is Lord of the table. He welcomes you to it as the host of this table. All you need to do is follow Christ as your Lord and Savior. And He wants to share the life-giving grace that only He can give through this means of grace and through all other means of grace. Let's pause together and lift up our prayers to the Lord. We thank you for this table, O oh God, as a reminder, and more than that, as a participation in the life that you give us with you, fulfilling us with grace. We ask that your Spirit would come upon these elements of bread and cup and come upon us, fill us full to overflowing with what only you can give us to quench our deepest thirst, to satisfy our deepest hungers, you are the bread of life. You are the living water. In you we have life abundant. And so open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, and our lives to receive you once again, perhaps for the first time, in a new way, in a transforming, powerful way, as only you can accomplish. Hear this prayer and hear us as we pray like Jesus taught us now, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 